Well, today, um, God's given us the blessing to come together and enjoy the first Sunday of the year 2019. As always, I want to use the first message of the new year to lay out a very direct and specific challenge to True North Baptist Church to direct our vision as we enter into this year. It's always a good habit, folks, to take stock of where we're at. Um, we did that last week, at least to some degree. It's always good to direct our focus in the area that God would have us to go, which is what I hope to do this week. I want to direct our hearts this morning to Luke chapter 5. It's been weighing heavily on my heart these past several weeks as I've studied and prepared for this. Luke chapter 5. You'll see that this is a miracle that took place in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ as he ministered to the multitudes. Beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass, as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the nets. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in another ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. <clears throat> Let's pray and specifically ask God to challenge our hearts with this today. Our Father, once again, we're humbled before you. We recognize that the opportunity even to come before you in prayer is a privilege that's been bought with the greatest cost in all the universe, the blood of our Savior. I thank you that we can enter into your presence both in prayer and that we can enter into your presence through your word. And this morning, uh, we, uh, we plead with you that you would take this living word and that you would apply it to our lives and that you would deeply challenge our hearts with it. Set our vision, I pray as we go into this new year, and help us to point it in the way that our Savior directs. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we see a picture of the disciples trying to catch fish. They had toiled all the night and had taken nothing according to the Scripture. Now, <clears throat> their efforts in doing that didn't consist of your average relaxing sport fishing expedition that we may be familiar with. Now, plenty of times I've been out fishing, and I really didn't care whether I caught anything or not. I was just enjoying the peace and the tranquility of the setting and the relaxation that came with it. I've also been out fishing and have worked very, very hard for it and come away with nothing to show for my efforts. The last year was the first time for my family personally this has ever happened to me. We made the, the trip to Chitna for dip netting three times to try and catch <laughs> fish for the freezer we worked hard against the current, the brutal conditions, and we came away with absolutely nothing. The work that the disciples did was the brutal, backbreaking, laborious work uh, of casting and pulling nets by hand, working against the Sea of Galilee that was very well known for its significant storms and its turbulent waters. It wasn't easy work. And they caught nothing at all that night. Their efforts were empty. Their efforts were fruitless. 
And then Jesus came along and he told them, I want to use your boat to preach from. And after he'd done that, he told them to go back out. And when they obeyed, they caught a great number of fish. And Jesus told Peter to summarize it and to drive the point home and all, all that he was really doing there. From henceforth, thou shalt catch men. And the Bible says that Peter and James and John forsook all and they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't even say what they did with all the multitude of the fish that they had just pulled in. Presumably, they just left them there and people came and took them for free. Well, that's the story. We'll turn your attention to verse 2. As we walk through this today, it says that Jesus saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. It was their routine. Every day when they came in from fishing to go through the nets and to make sure there was no seaweed or other particles that were clinging to the net, and they would inspect for any damage to the nets, and then they would wash their nets and clean them and get them ready for the next day's catch. That's their routine. Um, some days it was good, and some days it was bad. And some days it was really, really, really bad. Uh, this day was one of those days. And they were very frustrated because they would had no success at all. Even with all their combined skill put together, all the efforts that they could bring to bear, they were completely unsuccessful. So we know that they'd thrown in the towel and they said, let's just be done for the day. And they were putting it all away so that they could go home. They tried their best. But the scripture says that they had caught nothing and so exhausted, they'd given up. They were likely worried. And they were likely disappointed because they were poor men who were going home without any fish. It was their livelihood, and it was probably what they ate. Now, at that time, and in that condition, and in that mental state, the Lord Jesus comes alongside them and tells them to just put the boat, the boat back in and thrust out a little from the land. I'll tell you that the verbiage there it implies immediately um, more difficult work that he was telling them to do. They'd already cleaned everything up or were in the process of it. And he's telling them, thrust the boat back out from the land. The word thrust there speaks of the, the muscle and the effort that had to be applied to the ship to get it away from the shoreline. Now, obviously, we're not here this morning to talk about fishing or fishing techniques. We're here to talk about the spiritual application of what we see in scriptures. And I, I want to immediately draw your attention to the spiritual applications as we walk through this and tell you that we need to make ourselves available to the Lord's service like these men did. And we need to do it like we have never done before. Push away from the affairs of this life and give the Lord a chance to do some mighty things with you. Close out all the noise and all the confusion around you and get yourself positioned so that you can listen carefully to his voice and get his further instructions. These men didn't have any answers. And we can say that they probably didn't have any expectations either. They just put the boat in the water like Jesus had said. And in doing that, they pushed out away from what they had previously had, capturing their attention. And that was the simple matter of going home and taking their ease or being governed by their circumstances there. Instead, they availed themselves to Jesus. Don't miss that. And then in verses 3 and 4, it says, And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. He started preaching the word of God while sitting in that boat of Simon's. You can imagine the disciples here now who worked all night long, intense manual labor. They didn't have uh, the mechanical equipment that's on commercial fishing boats today to reel the nets in. And even though that's tremendously hard labor as well, they've done all of this tremendous labor all night long, and had worn themselves out. 
You know, they were like some of our shift workers that we have here in the church who work Saturday night, all night long sometimes, and then faithfully come and sit in the presence of God on Sunday morning. So praise God that you do that if you're one of them. I've done it many times myself. It shows where your heart's at. Well, the disciples were experiencing that now. And they just wanted to go home. The lake was the last thing that they wanted to see. But that's where Jesus directed them. And so Jesus started preaching. And when Jesus preached, he would frequently preach for hours and hours and hours on end. And he wasn't like me. Jesus was able to do that and actually hold people's attention indefinitely to the point that the disciples would have to come and say, Hey, it's almost nighttime, Jesus. The people are hungry. We've got to send them away. And, and, and the people would still be sitting there enraptured by what Jesus had to say. Well, we don't know how long he preached. But I can just imagine the disciples were sitting there saying, Lord, when are you going to stop so I can just go home? I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I've been working all night. You know, some people sit in preaching that way, wondering when the preacher will be done so they can just go. When that happens, you miss everything that God's trying to do. You can only imagine that maybe the disciples missed some of what Jesus' intent was here, at least initially. Well, Jesus finished his message for however long that took, and he turned once again to Peter, and he made another request. I can imagine that Peter was thinking, you know what? I hope that he's ready to go home now. I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. And Jesus' request to Peter must have just baffled him all the more. Launch out into the deep now, Peter, and let down your nets for a drought. I can guess that the frustration is mounting. None of those disciples wanted to do that. They had worked in that same sea through the night, and they caught nothing at all. But now Jesus is asking them to put all their nets back out, which was going to entail not just the work of, of casting nets and drawing them back in, and if there were fish to be caught, then processing and cleaning, and then having to re-clean all of their equipment again. But Jesus is asking them to do just that. Simon, answering, said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that phrase. Here's a man who was willing to make a change. Here we see a man who's willing to obey. He looked at Jesus, the master, who's telling him to launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught, and he's willing to try something different than he has been trying and attempting in the past simply because God told him to do it. I want to explain uh, a little bit further why this is so significant. It was a well-known fact that the Sea of Galilee, or in the Sea of Galilee, fishermen caught fish at night. That's why the disciples had been out there all night long. That was the technique that you used to catch fish. And so they caught their fish at night, and they caught their fish in shallow waters, not in the heat of the day, and not out in the deep water. They thought that they knew fishing. They thought that they knew success. They thought they had skill. Now, Peter knew every reason, and they were good ones. He knew every reason why not to obey Jesus here. He could have rationalized it away and come up with any number of excuses, but under the direct command of Jesus himself, though it didn't seem to make sense to him, humanly speaking, Peter turned from his logic, and he staked everything on Jesus' word. Now, up to this point, we can say this, that they were operating in their comfort zone, weren't they? They were doing um, what they knew to do, but they were operating in the shallows. Folks, I have no doubt that God has a tremendous catch for us to pull in this year as a church, as individuals, in a spiritual sense. But in order for that to happen, every single one of us has to get out of the shallows and launch out into the deep. We need to get out of the shallows of commitment. We need to get out of the shallows in our availability to God and to his service. We need to get out of the shallows in our spiritual service 
through the church and utilizing the gift things that God's given to us, and we need to get out into the deep waters. One of our greatest obstacles in seeing the miraculous power of God is our own apathy, our own complacency. You know, we generally do what we want to do. And most of us don't want to leave our comfort zone. And so in today's accommodating culture, we're willing to dabble in service for the Lord. We may even wade out just a little bit further than the next Christian to us. But we insist frequently on staying near the shore. You know, it's one thing to receive Jesus as your Savior. I pray that everybody here in this room today has done that. And that you've personally placed your trust and your confidence in Him. That your sins are taken care of. But it's another thing entirely, or, or it should naturally follow from that, to wholeheartedly follow Him as a disciple. Moving into deep water requires full and absolute commitment. It means that you weigh anchor and you set your sails to catch the wind and you get out away from the shore, it means that you leave the shallows behind, fully surrendered to the directions of our great captain. In the murky waters of shallow Christianity, we lose focus. We forget the very purpose of ministry is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dying world. In the shallows, we're often busy and we generate a vast array of programs and busyness and busy work, but we don't catch fish. So many ministries today become more about service than about reaching lost men and women with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we talk about our vision for the new year, understand that everything that we do must, must funnel into that explicit primary sole purpose. That is the job of our church. Most people, if they're ever willing to share anything at all with the lost, will share their faith only through a shallow lifestyle type of evangelism, if you can really call that evangelism at all. And it's an approach that, uh, that is void of direct verbal witness of God's word to the lost around them. Very few people who claim to be believers have a, a real burden that weighs on their hearts or any real interaction of sharing salvation with someone else on a regular basis. Is it any wonder that American Christians are stagnant and cold? Do you know a, a parallel reality to that? With the stagnancy and the shallowness of American Christianity, very few people read their Bibles. Very few people pray or serve with any regularity, and those are directly interrelated with one another. Content with the status quo, most people will sit on the dock and they'll look out over the water, offering usually only complaints about our nation turning away from God or grumbling about any kind of spiritual challenge that's directed their way. Now up to this point, as we look into our text here, the little bit of work that they had done was dabbling in the shallows there. It was in their own strength. Now they realized that Jesus was asking them to do something really out of the ordinary. You know, there's a huge difference in that. When we try to do things in our own strength, in our own ability, we nearly always fail. Almost always. I've seen that in the ministry, folks. I've seen that in my professional life. George Mueller said it very well. He said, there is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Why do we experience a lack of fruit in ministry? <clears throat> Why could we often echo Peter's comment? in our hearts or in our church ministry that we've toiled all the night and we've taken nothing. It isn't for lack of resources. We have the boat. We have the nets. There's no lack of souls that need Jesus Christ. 
The sea is open and it's ready for us. We fail when we neglect the challenge to make the decision to launch out at the Lord's word. We also fail when we operate in our own strength and in our own wisdom. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that Peter made himself available. That is key, brothers and sisters. That is key. And I want to ask you very pointedly and very directly this morning, have you made yourself available? That is the starting point. Oftentimes, people say that they're committed to following Jesus, but they don't make themselves available because they really aren't wholly surrendered. And so when the rubber meets the road, they're not there. They're not participating. They're not a part. Peter called Jesus in this scripture master. That indicates to me complete surrender. That's the verbiage of a servant speaking to a slave owner or to a master in that uh, culture. Jesus asked them to do this. And now they're willing to just go for it. They're going to do it. Now, it's the same place. It's the same boat. These are the same fishermen. It's the same waters. But they realize that there is a factor now that is totally, totally different. Before, they were without Jesus. Now, they are with Jesus. It makes all the difference in our lives as we seek to serve him and minister for him through this church. It takes the empowerment of God himself to do this work that we're called to do this year. When we're without Jesus, all is a waste. How many of us can say that before Jesus... We wasted 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever number you want to put on it, whether you're saved or whether you're not saved, but you're operating out of his strength and without holy surrendering. It's all a waste and nothing comes out of that. But now Jesus is present and everything is different. When Jesus really comes into a person's life, folks, everything is changed. Jesus is the key factor in their boat now. Now, Simon is willing to obey the word, of, the word of God, and his choice in that moment was the pivotal point for the rest of his life. Peter's decision and the resulting miracle reveal that a single act of obedience to Christ's command can change the entire course of a life. Before anything great can be accomplished for Christ, We have to make the decision to launch out at his command. Like Peter, our response to God's word will either invite his blessing and his power, or it will hinder it from being able to take place. And we recognize today, or we ought to recognize, that great things will only happen in our church and in our personal lives as we serve him through this church, as we launch forward in our service to Christ. Without spirit-led, spirit-filled action, Our lives and our ministries will become or will stay spiritually stagnant. Our efforts will yield empty nets every time. Don't miss that reality today. And scripture says that they caught a great number of fish on that day. Now what a blessing that day was for those men. A tremendous blessing. We continue in verse 10. uh, It's talking about the, the, uh, the shock that Peter had, the astonishment that he had at the great number of fish. And in verse 10, it says, And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They're astonished too. They were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. They were all humbled before the feet of Jesus, and they recognized that this was a miracle that only God could do. Now, Peter knew, he knew, having grown up in the family business, that you couldn't get fish in that way. It was not possible. Couldn't do it in that way. Couldn't do it in that place. You couldn't do it at that time of day. He knew that God was at work now. Jesus told them, don't be afraid. 
Though this is completely out of the ordinary, don't be afraid, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. What a drastic change in the life of Peter. We see man's desire on one hand, and we see God's desire on the other hand. Don't miss that contrast either. Man's desire is all about the world, all about temporal things, things that are just going to pass away. It's all about human ambition, making a living or, or, or career or those directions. But God's desire is all about the eternal. And his entire purpose for doing this miracle was to drive, powerfully drive this message home to Peter's heart. Can't you relate to this? Folks, we walk and we toil in this world for our living and for our career and for all the other things in this life. But in the midst of all that, God has a much more important purpose in our lives, and that is to work in his kingdom for his purpose. You have uh, a great desire an ambition to be a success in this world, to get married, to have children, to have a great career, to have a house and a car, toys and accomplish a whole lot. God has a much higher design. He has a much higher ambition for his people. And so as we look at this story here, what we can see is that the entire thing is taken on 180 degree turn now. In that moment, as, uh, as, as this miracle is performed and Jesus told Peter the impetus of that miracle, hey, from henceforth, you're going to catch men. This is a work that God did here and God's going to continue to do it as you focus on the eternal. In that moment, something clicked in Peter's mind. His thoughts are completely reversed from how he had thought before. If he was unsure about his purpose prior to this, he wasn't now. No longer was he going to focus on business expansion or career advancement. He wasn't going to be out pricing new boats or scouting out for more partners. From this moment forward, he would be a fisher of men. We understand he still had to make a living. He still had to pay the bills and take care of his family. But his purpose was different now. His focus was different. On behalf of Christ himself, Peter would call people to their Savior. This is why we launch out, friends. It's not for our glory or to fulfill our quest for adventure. We launch out to catch men, to connect hearts that are desperately in need with the invitation of Christ to salvation. We launch out to preach the gospel, to tell broken, shattered people that there is salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. The launching out it isn't about expanding our reputation. It's not about fulfilling our ego. It's a decision to live fully for the glory of God by leading lost souls to Christ. Now, there's a key thought here. One of the things that Jesus did to help Peter make this 180-degree turn and make him useful was to bring him to a point where he realized that he was nothing. God taught him in reality, that he was good for nothing. Peter was the one who was supposed to have all the skills here. He had the, the skill sets. He had the knowledge. He had the wisdom, not Jesus. He was a fisherman, not Jesus. Jesus was just a carpenter. He taught Peter that he didn't have any abilities of his own. Jesus taught Peter that he wasn't even good for catching fish. From now on, he would catch me. Every one of us folks needs to have a proper estimation of ourselves. We must not think of ourselves or our abilities more highly than we ought to think. We have no abilities to do anything good in and of ourselves. But glory to God. He's able to take a, a useless, fruitless vessel and use it to transmit his power, and he's able to use it to transmit his ability to souls that are desperately in need. God gifts his people. Every one of us, God gifts his people with the ability 
to speak his word and to convey it powerfully and effectively. You don't have the strength. Sometimes God takes us through situations like what Peter had to go through so that he can prove to us that we're nothing. Just a big zero. And then he can show what he can do with a yielded soul. Now Jesus is telling Peter, your desire is for fish, but my desire is for souls. God doesn't want us to just grow up and eat and drink and live out a meaningless and trivial existence in this world and then go out of the world. He wants us to make an eternal impact in lives. The people of the world can't do that because they don't believe in eternity. You and I can do it because we believe in eternity and we believe in God who created eternity. Jesus made a U-turn here in the life of Peter I believe that God's saying something to our church through this today. We may very well be tremendously ashamed this morning if we were asked right now to give an accounting of how many souls we've won to Jesus Christ. How many times have you personally invested the Word of God and the Gospel? to someone's life and saw it bring forth fruit. How many times? Some people may have to say ashamed. Not even one soul. Not even one. My whole life long that I've won for Jesus Christ. Now folks, you know this. We're not in it for numbers here. But catching men is what it's all about. Are we going to stand before the Lord empty-handed? Are we doing anything of eternal impact? People grow stagnant and cold in their walk with God and in their service to God for many reasons. Peter found himself in a position where he needed to make a clear decision to stop dabbling in the shallows and launch out into the deep for good. That change that came into his life was sudden and it was instant and it was absolute. Sometimes God brings us through tremendous changes so that we can become an effective tool in his hands. Don't miss out on understanding the gates that he leads you through to accomplish this. Don't despise it when he leads you to make these commitments and changes. In Peter's own life, his profession, and his focus was changed immediately. He was a fisherman, but Jesus said, from henceforth, you're going to catch men. When faced with major spiritual decisions or commitment like this, I've seen a lot of people approach this matter kind of like they do a diet. And when I've heard people talk about going on a diet or starting some kind of exercise plan or changing in some way in their life, I always hear them say, tomorrow I'm going to start this diet. Next week, next month, there's always some projected point somewhere out there in the future, even if it's the next day. Jesus didn't say next year. He didn't even say tomorrow. But he said, from henceforth, from now on, you're going to catch men. That was immediate. Right then, the change was required. An instant change was brought into the life of Peter. Now listen, God is... Powerful, and this is how he works when we allow him to in our hearts with a sense of urgency to act immediately in these eternally important matters. God says, do it now. Do it now. This wasn't just in the life of Peter, I'll have you know, but among the Jews and the Romans of that day also. They, uh, it was critical for Peter to make this decision because of the impact that he had on others. That's why 3,000 and 5,000 were added to the church early in the chapters of the book of Acts when Peter started preaching. When God brings the change into your life and you're wholly committed and you launch out, people will be affected around you. In society and in the community, God's telling us, launch out and let down your nets for a draught, for a tremendous catch. And I encourage you folks, every one of you, go for it. 
because I believe that God's about to do some tremendous things through his people here in this coming year if we make ourselves available to that. I also believe that God's going to make the fish ready. All those fish in the Sea of Galilee that day were called together by God and were ready to be caught on that day. God had been working behind the scenes to produce that catch. If, if God is bringing a change into our lives and asking us to do something, and we obey and we get to it, it means that God's preparing those souls to be caught. He's bringing them and leading them to where they need to be to receive the powerful word of God. But it happens only when we're willing to go. Only when we're willing to obey. Only when we're willing to take the risk. Only when we're willing to launch out into the deep and let down the nets. When we do that, we see God makes eternal impacts in lives of people around us. And I believe that this morning, God's speaking to some of us. I have no doubt of that at all. We're not an ordinary church or congregation in our thinking or in our direction. I believe that God's brought us together, friends, for the express purpose of making changes in lives, making changes in our society, and making changes in the vision of our local churches to align intensely with his word. I believe that God's preparing us to impact the world. I believe that the day is coming. Hear me now. Don't, don't uh, zone out and don't let me lose you. I believe the day is coming that God's going to pull some of us out of our comfort zones. Is there anybody here that's afraid of that? I've talked to a lot of people who have said, I'm afraid of what God's going to do if I surrender myself to him. God cannot use us when we're in our comfort zones. <coughs> the reason is that it's because we're operating in our own strength. We're operating in our own ability when we are there in our comfort zones. God's trying to challenge us to get out of the shallows. That's why he has brought us here to this church. Now, God may change your priorities. If we were to list our priorities, friends, they may be totally different than one another, right? That shouldn't be if we're all really surrendered to God here in this place. They should all be the same. Priorities should not vary from one person to the next that surrender to God. Some of our priorities may be different than God's priorities. And as God brings change to your life and pushes you out of the shallows in Christian service, he's going to change those priorities to align with his. I was learning some things as I read this week about the behavior of eagles. They're really smart birds. As their young grow older, at some given point in time, the parents deconstruct and destroy their own nests. They take them apart. Otherwise, the little ones would stay so comfortable sitting in their nest that they wouldn't want to learn how to fly. The adults destroy the nest, so the little ones are pushed out, and they're forced to learn how to fly. I believe that God's doing that in the midst of us here, folks. To bring some of us out of the comfort zone and more effectively teaching us how to stand and how to fly. What do we need to do? What do we need to do? We need to be willing. Peter said this, powerful words, at thy word I will. As the word of God is delivered to your heart, be willing to launch out into the deep as the Lord is asking you to do. I don't know the specific depths into which the Lord intends to take you. It could be some of those priorities um, that you need to get fixed once and for all. It could be some area of complete surrender that you need to make to him. It may be some commitment or some area of service that he's directing your life into. I'm not trying to be the Holy Spirit today, and I can't dictate to your heart what that is. But what does launching out into the deep mean to you? This morning, God's looking for some serious change in hearts and lives. When God came to Peter, he was changed once and for all. 
he was forever changed. He was done playing in the showers at that point, and he became a man of God who powerfully preached in the first generation after the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. He was instrumental in thousands of people coming to the Savior. And he was also a man of God who was crucified himself. For the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the commitment that he had for God. This morning, we don't know the plans that God has for each one of us. But I strongly believe that the kind of change that God is making in your lives and in our church is going to have an eternal impact. Not only on your life, but also on our community and around the world. What does God ask of you today? That you should be willing to obey. As the Lord tells us to launch out into the deep and let down your nets. When we're willing to follow Christ into the deep, unfamiliar waters, we'll have a closer fellowship with him. But most importantly, our lives will take on the meaning that is found only in following him. As we launch out in sharing the gospel, giving our time, giving our resources, and humbling ourselves to share uh, his word, humbling ourselves to serve, our growth becomes far deeper than that of someone who insists upon sitting on the dock. Out in the deep water, we learn to trust Jesus. We learn how to pray. Those who launch out learn very quickly that God accomplishes great things with a life that is lived wholly by faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. How many people this morning are willing to say, Lord, no matter what change you bring into my life, no matter how deep you want me to launch the boat, I'm willing. Let's pray.